Osseocleides bathulifera, aka the shiny spotted orchid, aka the snake orchid, is being repotted today on the patio. I will talk about her care in Lekka and self-watering, a form of semi-hydroponics, but I will also give you the care for this orchid. If you're not into growing orchids in inorganic media, I will tell you everything about the alternative method of growing this orchid. And also, we will address the timing, which is today. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. This is my orchid, Coite Atanctuista, Osseocleides bathulifera, and I got her in 2019. I've repotted her twice since I've got her simply because certain things were happening in the pot I wasn't entirely sure about. So this will be my third repot. The first time I repotted her, I noticed that you should never cut the roots because you don't know if they're dead or alive, which we will be looking into today. I'll show you the difference if I see any dead roots, that is. But also the best timing is, as a matter of fact, a little bit later at the stage of where my orchid is at at the moment because she hasn't formed her bulb yet. But you can see she's not going to have much space to form a bulb if I don't get into this right now. <laughs> she's really tight up against the pot. They can also see that there's a bulb here that is desiccated. I just don't want to pull it off because this orchid actually is more of a succulent type growing orchid. She is terrestrial. So understand that anything terrestrial can easily adapt to a semi-hydroponic setup with Lekka and self-watering. Initially, this method was invented for house plants. So when I hear terrestrial, I see orchid, I'm like going, hoo-hoo, it's gonna work. And lo and behold, it does. Anywho, let's get her out of the pot. If you are not into this kind of media, then consider her as a succulent kind of orchid. You will see how the roots differ from anything else. And you would want a really good draining mixture of organic media. Anything, let's say, if you grow some vidiums, that would be also perfect. You can see what I mean when I say some vidiums. These roots, they are just like some vidium roots with a little bit of an extra challenge to them because they will die if you cut them. So we're going to have to be very careful and not just yank the orchid out. I need to get the microfiber out before I do any kind of radical pulling. Everything that falls away from the roots automatically, that's perfectly fine. But if you cut a live root, it will immediately fail in the pot, no matter the media. Does nothing to do with whether I'm working with a semi-hydroponic setup or if you were to put it into a classic, let's say, cymbidium kind of setup. And there's one root attached right by the microfiber. It's grown into it. We're going to have to deal with that. So you see, I have a pretty good root system and even the roots in the back are alive. They are firm to the touch, and if they were to be dead, they would be very spongy feeling. Let me get her out before I show you a dead root as opposed to a live root. Before I go anywhere, we are going to separate this root from the fiber that it's grown into. And little loops in the microfiber and roots find their way in. So as carefully as possible, we're going to try and dislodge that root. Something like this. There's another one right here. Oh, that wasn't attached. Okay, this is what we've got. We're okay with timing. These roots grew when the pseudobulbs started to plump up and mature. So they don't grow straight away, as you can see with this growth right here, which is the new growth. But as the pseudobulb starts to appear, then before it entirely matures, 
that is when roots grow. So we're very, very early in this process, but I do need that growth to be able to find some space. Now, here is the desiccated pseudobulb, which I can now take off the rhizome. And with that, because these roots here are firm, you see, They're, it's not a root system that will die on you, which is awesome. So as the orchid grows, it can also grow from strength to strength. Eventually it will bloom when it has enough substance to it. So here are the dead roots. Same as with any other orchid. They feel much more spongy. They give a lot. Here, they are firm. Not rock hard, but super firm. There's a distinct difference. Okay, what I also don't want to have happen is have moss grow too high onto these pseudobulbs because, as mentioned, Yes, they are firm, but they have a succulent kind of a feel about them. So your organic mix needs to be airy, needs to have great drainage, and consider a cymbidium kind of mix for this orchid if you are going to grow in organic media. As you can see in my case, I used very large LECA. The reason being, I have very chunky roots. So my LECA ratio is adapted to match the root structure. And seeing as she's not that thirsty, in a wet dry cycle she would do well, but in active growth she needs to be watered regularly. This orchid grows in the northwest of Madagascar where it's very arid, very dry. It also grows in Kenya. And that is why she's also in my collection. I never saw her out in the wild, but in Kenya she grows on the grasslands or in woody kind of forests. Not to be mistaken that she's in any way, shape, or form epiphytic. Just because of the woodland forest, she stays terrestrial. But with all that being said, you can basically see that the light levels, she should not be exposed to direct sunlight all the time. She can take bright, bright shade all the time or dappled light with a lot, a lot of airflow. Being a warm to hot grower, she is accustomed to hot air around her foliage. However, hot air and sun compounds heat. So even if there's a lot of airflow and the sun is shining, the airflow is hot as well. There is no cooling effect. So keep that in mind if you're cultivating this orchid in your private collection. Bright shade is the safest bet. As I mentioned, mine has not bloomed yet. So I'm hoping to eventually, maybe next year or the following year, get her to bloom. Again, she needs to have more structures. She needs more energy as backup because the bloom spikes, even though the blooms themselves are pretty nondescript, the spikes are pretty long. They take a lot of energy for them to develop and for the orchid to bloom. The spikes would always come from the base of a pseudobulb. Her common name being the shiny spotted orchid, it's pretty self-explanatory when you put her leaves into the sun and also known as the snake orchid which is also pretty obvious anyway i'm going to get her pot because this is pretty straightforward it is not rocket science this orchid is a relatively easy grower even in my cooler cooler winters she is okay but i have to baby her while she is indoors now, I could go back to the pot size she was originally in, but I don't want to be doing this again next year. I want her to be in her pot for another two, three, maybe even four years so that I don't keep bothering her. So she's going into a much larger pot. And we're going to reestablish her status quo as per what she is accustomed to very, very quickly, I would say. I'm going to fill some water just to protect the roots and make sure that our LECA goes everywhere because I will once again be using large LECA. Let's get that loop. Let's sort that out a bit. I don't want to pour too much in because I don't want to snap or crack the roots. Any damage to them. And we will be minus 
those roots very, very quickly. What's going on here? Ah, uh, you're still okay. All righty. Okay, now we have a very clear direction of growth. Normally, I will always say put your orchid into the middle of the pot. And in this case, I don't see the need. And if she proves me wrong, that is even better news. I will not complain at all, but I see a clear, distinct direction of growth so far. I've only ever achieved one suitable per year. So as I'm thinking ahead, two years, three years, she's got plenty of space, and that is why I'm going to park her towards the back. I'm also contemplating if these pseudobulbs could be snug together. No, that changes her angle in the front. A square pot would be ideal in this situation because then we could use the diagonal, but we don't have a square pot for this orchid at our disposition. So this is how she's going to be. So the temperatures for this orchid, really, they have to be anywhere above 20 degrees Celsius. And then of course, as hot as it can get in bright shade. Shouldn't go down lower than 20 degrees. And well, my winters where she lives indoors, will go down to 14 degrees Celsius. And that is, of course, when she's not actively growing. So I'm very, very careful with regards to the watering that I do for this orchid during the winter. I maintain the dampness of the leka. I do not allow the leka to stay wet. There is a difference. And all I do is make sure that the microfibers are always damp. Because if I have damp microfibers, damp to the touch, not wringing them out with droplets on them, that means the pot interior is damp as well. If my microfibers go dry, then it's high noon, just to add a little bit of water into my reservoir, just to let it soak up the microfibers, and that's it. But I do not have any residual water in the reservoir. When it comes to potting up, we want to maintain the status quo of the media level with the rhizome, with the pseudobulbs, and any roots that we have exposed, they need to be tucked back in with the media around them. You do not want air around these roots. This is not an epiphyte. So let's just hold on to the orchid and give the pot a good little tap and see if we have any settling of the media. I did soak her before the repot. Just to be on the safe side, I gave her some calcium and magnesium, but it's a very weak calcium and magnesium solution for this one. I only have one growth coming. She is not a big orchid, so I went in with 50 parts per million of CalMag. No seaweed at this point in time, because the other day was when she got her seaweed fix. So 50 parts per million, it was a blitz soak because I wanted the nutrients to be absorbed straight away. So I made the pH at 6.8. When I fertilize this orchid, it is also extremely weak. I stick to the weak solution of also no more than 100 parts per million. And then I watch the surface of the media to see if she is able to absorb 100 parts per million or am I accumulating salts because you can see this pseudobulb right here looks very, very salty, and that is possibly due to over-fertilizing. So I didn't fertilize at every filling of the reservoir. I have now reduced that to maybe once a month when I fertilize just once a month with her to avoid the salt accumulation. So the surface of the media and the surface of the orchid will also give great insight to how much this orchid actually needs to be fertilized, which is pretty much next to nothing. So I'm considering telumnia values for this orchid, even though my telumnias grow a little bit faster, but when it comes to fertilizing, those are the values I have adopted for this orchid. A weak solution and only once a month. So I'm just seeing white bits sticking out here. I'm just finding lacquer sizes that would fit so that I can cover that up again. And if you have one that comes where the root is exposed, not quite, let's say, covered up, if it arrives new and you are just potting it up fresh, put a little bit of sphagnum moss around the root that is exposed to the air because these are not aerial roots. This orchid does not 
grow aerial roots. And if I don't like this because it's not staying, I will also use sphagnum moss, but I think my little teepee here is going to work. There we go. So seeing as she had her CalMag soak, I don't need to in any way put any fertilizer into the reservoir. It'll just be plain RO water. One thing to note about this orchid, if she doesn't have enough storage structures, as in pseudobulbs, etc., she will lose the leaves of the previous pseudobulb once her new growth has matured. So that is why you see my pseudobulbs in the back don't have leaves. Now, I'm hoping that bit by bit she has enough storage organs so that she does keep the leaves of her previous pseudobulb. Let's see what happens with her this time around with a little bit more space in the pot. If she ever blooms for us, I'm going to be super interested to know what her fragrance is like. The blooms really aren't showy or flashy, they're also very waxy. But she is supposed to have blooms that are fragrant, which is super duper exciting. If you found this video interesting, if it helped you in any way, please consider giving it a like. Ask any questions in the comments if you have anything to add with regards to what I just mentioned as general care. Feel free to add that to the comments as well. The more, the merrier for everybody that visits the comments section for additional information. Take a moment as well to subscribe to the channel. Your support is appreciated, as is the fact that you watch this video. Thank you so, so much for your time. I wish you a beautiful day on that one condition, though. Please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.